So I'm very excited to introduce the second speaker of this panel, Chadwick Truscott Smith. Since receiving his PhD from NYU in 2012, Chadwick Smith has taught at both Rutgers University and NYU, and he's currently teaching at Barnard College. His first book, Human Rights and Self-Defense, 19th Century German Experiments on Democracy, under review with Bloomsbury Publishing, analyzes the contradictory history of human rights in the works of Goethe, Bücher, Büchner, Stifter, and Metternich. Chadwick's publications include Inter, but not National, Willem Flusser, and the Technologies of Exile, for De Greuter, the De Greuter volume Escape to Life, German Intellectuals in New York, 2012, and The Butterfly and the Potato, Willem Flusser and Design for Art US in 2009. Taken together, they speak of both a continuous engagement with media theory in general and with Friedrich Kittler's friend Willem Flusser in particular. His current project on Flusser addresses the necessity of media studies for any consideration of social justice in the digital world. Today, Chadwick Smith will speak about Kittler and dancing skeletons in his talk titled Bones of Contention, the Challenges of Kittler's Recursive History. Please join me in welcoming Chadwick Smith. Uh, thank you, Danya, for that incredibly generous um, introduction. Um, First, of course, I'd like to thank Avital Rennell and Arna Hooker for inviting me today to share my brief thoughts on Hitler with you and in such illustrious company. Um, I was not in Freiburg or Berlin or any of the other scenes of pedagogy from which so many of our presenters today hail. But as a student interested in media studies coming through the university in the late 90s and early 2000s, Hitler had already determined my situation. At times consciously and at times not, I've ended up doing Hitler. And, and today that will mean recursively. Um, and I am today continuing to work out exactly what that means. Um, so this paper will be of a different character than the thrilling journey Professor Rickles just brought us on. But, okay. okay, bones of contention. In 2000, Friedrich Kittler presented a paper for the Stages of Knowledge in the Sciences Conference at the Freie Universität Berlin which was later published under the title, Man as a Drunken Town Musician. A citation from Emile Dubois Raymond's Natural Science and Fine Art, this suggestion that the human is both inebriated and musical in its essence has proven an irresistible provocation for me. Kittler's essay deals with two 19th century texts on movement, art, and science, Dubois Raymond's book, and the one with which it is explicitly concerned, Wilhelm and Edward Weber's Mechanics of the Human Walking Apparatus, an Anatomical Physiological Investigation. Kittler, armed with these books, traces a new history of film. It starts with the attempt to formulate a science of motion through a mathematical modeling of the leg bones and the equations, and finally ends with the image of man stumbling into the flickering light of a spinning stroboscope. This text is thus not really about a drunken musician. It is a text about bones, but it's really a text about the equations the bones produce. And in the end, it's a text about film. The musician of the title will be squeezed out in order to enable the technical history of film to be written. Bones are all that remains when the subject is dispersed throughout various media, when the body, as is the overarching project, becomes a product of physiology and language is reduced to information technologies. What I find intriguing in this text, however, is these bones stubbornly remain here and elsewhere in the history of media. They form the remainder of a changing human subject bound together in a ball and socket joint in a series of disavowed metaphors that will make recursion possible. Today I will stay in close proximity to Kittler's town musician essay for a few reasons, primarily for its reliance on bones, but also for its drunkenness, a subtle but powerful gesture to the Rausch that he sees as essential to Greece. With it, he links the effects of contemporary technology to a promising, always already dehumanized or dehumanitiesized uh, trajectory of European culture that ended when the Socratics entered the scene. Man as a drunken town musician is a staging of this product process as indicated when Kittler Oat begins with the line, quote, the sciences are on stage again. And this sentence actually loops around to the essay's last, quote, on computer monitors, science steps onto the stage. And thus performs at once, if I can make a, uh, a gesture of Kittlerian proportions, the totality of his gesture of recursive history. This formal staging combined with his reference to Greece lead me to believe that drunk man as a drunken town musician is a distilled version of the function and role of recursion in his later works, 
highlighting both its challenges and its promise. So, one, one. Already in Kittler's famous opening to gramophone film typewriter, quote, media determine our situation, a theory of the subject and histories of specific media are intertwined. Kittler's project on one hand reinterprets early 19th century culture from a discovery of the imaginary and consequent depth of the individual as a historical byproduct of a certain discourse network. In doing so, he reinterprets the Lacanian orders of the imaginary, symbolic, and the real, and matches them to different technologies that construct and store different reals, leaving the imaginary to be populated by that technology's uniquely constituted subject. On the other hand, or in this way, Kittler's oeuvre has to me never been about erasing any and all anthropological consideration. It is rather aimed at disrupting the naturalization of a specific humanistic tradition, however large that tradition is. Kittler still tackles in some ways the question of the constitution of the subject, yet avoids the vocabulary that pumps up, among other things, the romantic self-sovereign subject. It is in all likelihood a cultural history large as the history of te media technologies, an alternative anthropology, or at least an alternative, alternative one, a post-anthropology, if you will. For Kittler, the constitution of the romantic subject is codified in the exemplary case of Goethe, who in a now famous response to Karl Friedrich Naumann, stops his science and his literature short of any numeric makeup when he declares, quote, I am dependent upon word, language, and images in their truest sense, and completely incapable to act in any way whatsoever through signs and numbers. Here, Goethe ensconces Dichtung as the true measure of Wahrheit, and in Kittler's analyses, leads to the founding moment of the modern German Geisteswissenschaften, when Goethe's Professor Faust steps onto the stage and announces a comprehensive skill set bereft of numbers, he drives the wedge between the two cultures of the humanities and the sciences. The elevated place granted to Goethe has continued to allow the humanities to disavow their numerical component because Faust, the magister, has, quote, a passion for the innermost secrets of nature, Kittler writes, a nature which punished loathsome measurings or even numeration of her exterior with contempt. In Kittler's narrative, these numbers will remain repressed within and in service to the alphabet throughout the Romantic era of, lit era of literature until an Auswanderung of numbers from letters, then, which will then come with the rise of technical images like photographs and film. In Kittler's history, as we will see, these images, these images, photographs and film, were made possible by bones, the bones in the Weber Brothers laboratory. Yet hadn't the discovery of another bone already had a hand in displacing humankind from its privileged divine position, when Goethe presented the discovery, his discovery of the presence of the intermaxillary bone in humans to a, in 1980, 1984, 1784, I've got the book on my brain now from the, 1784 to a crowded Jena salon. The absence of this bone had been accepted scientific doctrine, and as humans were the only creatures thought to lack it, the essential difference between humans and all other animals was brought down to this minimal mark. With, his discovery, however, with its discovery, however, humans were reinserted into other morphologies and put, back into, and put into relation to other creatures. Goethe's discovery was not met with much acceptance, mainly because of the dominance of Petrus Kamper's view of human anatomy, but also, as Nicholas Boyle remarks, Another problem faced by Goethe's discovery was that he didn't have a theoretical framework within which to explain the ramification of his findings. Perhaps not until Kittler's own discourse and recursive methods allow for communication between these two bones, Goethe's and those in Kittler's own works. If so, Goethe's bone disrupts Kittler's history, this loop of history. With the discovery of the intermaxillary bone, Discourse Network 1800 was already displacing the human subject from its privileged position and precisely along the suture lines of a bone. If we follow Kittler's methodology, wherein one examines the reappearance of a phenomenon again and again at different times and in different contexts without recourse to linear causality, then perhaps Goethe is not the hero of Discourse Network 1800, the one who escorted the voice of a changing imago of the mother into the whispers of nature in his wanderer's night song. If he rather appears as a technician examining the sutures in a bone, then Goethe can become Hitler avant la lettre. This is said half-jokingly, to be sure. A witticism aimed both at Kittler's relation to his source material and at Goethe's position in the German canon. But it is one enabled by Kittler's process of, his, of recursion and highlights the, the sort of new types of readings he can get to from doing this by placing these things next to each other. Um, recursion has perhaps been best described as an analepsis of the prolepsis. 
the analepsis of the prolepsis, prolepsis of the analepsis. In the vocabulary, one can already hear a loop. It's a circuit. Um, and not to reinvent the wheel, uh, here I'm leaning on the work of many others who have summarized what recursion is, many of whom are in the room today. Um, the process of recursion in historiography traces the appearance of a procedure or phenomenon back to a chosen point in history and then retraces it back to the present. An altered present is thus already grounded in and justified by an ordinal beginning that is itself already changed by, already changed from the perspective of the present. Similar to the temporality of Schiller's naive and sentimental poets, Discourse Network 1800 can only be identified from the vantage point of Discourse Network 1900. Yet the dynamic part of this movement is that when this happens, 1900 is already changed by its excursion into the past. Recursive histories may thus become ever-expanding loops. With each orbit, the ellipse goes larger, reaching out to encompass more and more territory. Yet by remaining with the iterations of its object and nothing else, it is a closed loop. It is, as Jeffrey Winthrop Yum writes, a self-enclosed, almost autopoietic process. If this is the case, the questions we must then continually ask, which I'm asking today are, what does this procedure produce and what does it foreclose? Two. Um, just to illustrate a few suggestions to these questions. Kittler's recursions produce a history of media written from the perspective of media themselves rather than human agency. In Man as a Drunken Town Musician, this medium is film. It, its history begins, however, not, quote, with diorama paintings or magic lantern players, but on an elementary threshold with the scientific history of moving, unquote. Namely, with Dubois Raymond's book and his remark, uh, remarks on the Weber, Weber Brothers project. The Webers sought to elaborate a general science of motion, but first needed to diagram the individual moving parts, in this case, the bones of the leg, the ball and socket joints. It is their methodology for generating these diagrams, however, that initiates this trek towards film and delights Kittler, who quotes from their book, quote, the femoral head, or so-called sphere, was sawn perpendicularly from in front backwards, and the section was then printed onto paper. The curvature of the two parts here cannot be altered by the drawer. The picture is indeed the imprint of the object itself. To establish a science of movement, the bones needed to present themselves without any mediation of an, or interpretation by human hands, as when anatomy was practiced, quote from Kittler, in its proud old amphitheaters, where the dissection resulted in findings that made their way to woodcuts only belatedly. This moment of reported findings of dissection is, of course, code for a hermeneutic process. In its absence, the inscription to which Kittler refers comes from the material trace of the body speaking for itself rather than any authorial consciousness. It is, to put in an equally problematic register, self-evident. Thus, Kittler concludes, the free will of the human drawing hand on scientific visualization remains just as excluded as it is in the mechanics of the legs themselves. On this worldly scene of all religions and dances of the dead, the skeleton appears on the stages of knowledge and points no longer to allegories of death but to, rather to nothing more than its own animation. No longer memento mori, these bones are bereft both of conscious intention and metaphorical meaning and simply indicate through their materiality the possibilities and limits of their own movement, a movement that can then be described mathematically through partial differential equations. All that remains then is for these equations, equations to become visible, which will be Dubois Raymond's entry into the story. What he finds so thrilling in the Weber brothers' text is that they finish their treatise on the science of moving with how-to instructions for the construction of a stroboscope that enables, for the first time in the history of science, Kittler claims, quote, the visualization of partial differential equations, end quote. The image of these equations consists of drawing a number of pictures representing a man in successive position, positions during two steps. In the end, these equations do not simply recreate a picture of a walking human being as a painter would. Rather, quote, this is Dubois Raymond, a peculiar effect presented itself. The figure portraying the beginning and end of the step where, the man, where a man rests for a short time on both feet certainly looks completely as painters have always already portrayed walking people, except that in the middle of the step, where the so-called moving leg swings past the standing leg, the most strange and even ludicrous sight appears. Like a drunken town musician, man seems to trip over his own feet, and no one has ever seen a man in such a position. Closing the loop, the final images of a human in motion produced by these equations that are generated from the direct and unmediate imprint of bones, thus becomes something else than that from which they came. Science, Kittler can now claim, quote, becomes the alienation effect, which strips quotidian and artistic perception, of, which strips quotidian artistic perfection of 
perception of the fiction of totalization in order to reveal the naturalistic truth of the drunken town musician behind the aesthetic appearance of human walking, end quote. The bones, that thus, the bones that first stood mutely as their own self-evidence, enabling the equations of walking, now return, to the human, return the human to the fully fleshed image of a drunken musician, but with a difference. Quote, instead of word, language, and image in the truest sense, Kittler writes, citing Goethe, symbol and number have taken over the human gait. That is, movement has passed through the equations and appears in scientific visualization, and Kittler can finally declare that it becomes, quote, cinematics in the modern sense. It calculates virtual movements in the virtual, that is, virt visualizable spaces, end quote. This truth he referenced dovetails, into the, dovetails with his work on Greece and the sirens. It is a truth contained in the reunification of mathematics, music, and meaning made possible again in a digital age. Goethe's subject was supposed to have thought of itself, if, yeah, Go if Goethe's subject was supposed to have thought of itself as sober and in control, in the digital age we are again drunk in the roush of song and sea and love and on the way back to Greece. This truth then lies in the part in vir virtual spaces of the stroboscope or later on the computer screen where data visualization becomes the new anthropology. Three. Our second question, what does rec recursion foreclose, is of a different rhetorical kind, which I will address with a few, let's call them suggestive comments, and come to a close. Larson Powell has written instructively about the similarities between Kittler's recursions and Luhmann's, and it's handy for me today. While for Luhmann, recursivity is a technical, functional operation, quote, Kittler sees it lying at the base of a transcendental knowledge. Not only is, it not, ref not, only is not reflection or self-knowledge, but may also serve to block off the latter. Already in Luhmann, recursiveness may serve to hide basal paradoxes with what he calls uh, invisibilization, in particular, the inability of systems to ground their own legitimacy, end quote. When Kittler, affirming in The Drunken Town Musician, when he affirms the, uh, uh, affirms the correspondence between the elements of nature to the elements of the alphabet, writing the quote, the basic relation between knowledge and writing has been so deep-seated it has scarcely reappeared, end quote. He practically cites this process of invisibilization. And it is telling that he is here commenting upon a hidden correlation at the basis of a knowledge system, one responsible for producing meanings and truths enabled by the Greek vowel alphabet, because for him this alphabet stands united with numbers at the beginnings of science. The rela this re and this relationship is the backdrop for the drunken town musician. When Kittler calls attention to the way in which this relation can fall out of sight because it is precisely so fundamental, he then marks the possibility of an analogous operation within the essay itself. Hidden in plain sight here is the fact that visualization of data is still a metaphor for the bones that produce the equations that produce the machine and its peculiar effect. This quality of, the re of recursions in general that leads Powell to, to claim that Kittler, quote, his Kittler's, quote, basal recursions are, in opposition to Luhmann, not functional in any technifiable sense, except perhaps rhetorical, end quote. Yet I would suggest that it is in rhetoric that recursion finds its actual technical efficacy. In Kittler's essay, metaphoricity must recede in order to, in a sense, make recursions real, to remove the metaphor from the bones, the geist from the Geisteswissenschaften, so that they may initiate film. This task given to Bones is not limited to the essay at hand, however. It is further calcified in gramophone film typewriter, when another bone fulfills the same role. In Kittler's reading of the skull and Rilke's Orgeräusch, the bone is again not a reassuring memento mori, but is rather the technical means by which to extend possible fields of experience. Running a primitive record player's needle along the coronal sutures on a skull, Rilke asks, quote, is there any contour, any contour that one could not, in a sense, complete in this way, and then experience it in another field of sense? This new sense sits precisely at the outer points of Kittler's recursive loop in the musician essay. For Kittler, Rilke's piece demonstrates writing without a subject. Before Rilke, quote, no one ever suggested to decode a trace that nobody had encoded and that encoded nothing. This trace thus all has no author, signifies no meaning. This the skull is thus retroactively altered along this new thinking of codes, traces, noise, and signal. Putting the figurative needle of Kittler's analyses to the materials of technical media, he opens up new fields of sense, though not sense-making. The Orgeräusch simply speaks for itself, speaks through the gramophone, and jumps into a reel newly created by the techniques of sound production. <laughs> 
Rilke's rumination thus corresponds to one of the main themes of Kittler's work and an enduring component of his legacy, the belief that media enable perception. That the ability to perceive a given phenomenon must first be fa fabricated before it is experienced is a point of recursion with natural science and fine art. When Dubois Raymond writes, quote, in order for styles and works of art to even appear, epistemological knowledge must first have been established in the field of their forms and colors. While the scientific truth seen in the stroboscope is a peculiar effect for Dubois Raymond, it prepares a sensorium of a different nest discourse network, perhaps, in which it will no longer be curious or strange. This functionality of the virtual space that enables both film and the filmic human subject, th this is, sorry, this is the functionality. If, as Kittler's beloved statement by Nietzsche claims, our writing tools are working on us, then the virtuality of film is its real functionality in the sphere of its visualization. But since the material conditions of these histories don't themselves actually change, the changes that may be effective in these recursive loops are accomplished not through the material conditions of the technical media, but rather through the writing about them. Not a history of technical media, but a historiography of them. So I'm just gonna claim, this is why I said suggestive. Uh, recursion exists on the level of metaphor which brings us to a close and back to the bare bones of the matter. The history of film, one that today returns as a drunken town musician, is itself based on this rewriting and justified through the self-evident that is non-metaphorical nature of bones. Yet as this process takes place on the rhetorical level, Kittler employs a time-honored strategy for texts involved with the real, a fiction of non-fictionality. Here, he pins his history of film to bones as a metaphor for their own non-metaphoricity. And in doing so, he's writing a kind of technical realism, doing what the genre always does, to proclaim to represent the real workings of the world while presenting an idealized configuration of it, purified of that which may contradict its program. So the bones don't precisely speak for themselves, though I don't think this is to be lamented. It is rather maybe a little encouraging. Uh, for Kittler's recursion to have any of the functionality some find lacking, these bones must take the steps from the dances of the dead to the metaphor for the raw materiality of history, and in doing so, dance into film's virtuality. The challenge for us is that bones may be, that may be that bones, and their, excuse me, the challenge for us may be that bones and their recursions are only real when they aren't. They switch continuously between points and not letting us get a fix on them, leaving open, and I practically jumped out of my seat during Professor Campos' talk, leaving open a new future and a new past. Um, and a loop never ends, so I'm going to artificially stop here. <laughs> and maybe endings are only real when they're not as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the bones. And uh, <clears throat> I was wondering how some kind of related material, mm, I mean related to bones, mm, of the very early Kittler would fit into your reconstruction of recursive histories. Um, that is, um, uh, that is his dissertation on uh, Konrad Ferdinand Meyer, mm -hmm. and uh, as you may may know, uh, the starting point for him to write this was his interest in fingernails, cut hair. Uh, and other stuff. Um, how do you call that? These shuppen, the flakes, yeah. flakes, flakes from the skin flakes, especially for someone who suffers from psoriasis. That was a, a challenge uh, for Friedrich Gittler through his uh, all his life, I think. So he the 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 the, the initiative idea for his dissertation came from the idea that our body is constantly producing bad things. Uh, all the time we live, our bodies produce bad things. So, so, so that is always produced um, by our living bodies. And this, of course, took him to Hegel's phenomenology and, and, and this enigmatic sentence, the, the Geist is ein Knochen. Spirit is a bone. Uh, the idea that nearly at this point Hegel's phenomen phenomenology failed because it was extremely difficult to find another dialectic mm -hmm. turn uh, 
to get out of that trap that the spirit is a bone. So that was the idea to write this dissertation uh, on, along this idea that dialectic sublation could fail and end up in these dead things that uh, bodies produce. And um, that is from the very early Kittler. And uh, I wonder how that could fit in into this um, recursion of, of bones and their metaphorization, literalization, virtualization, and so on. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is something that cannot be sublated, or maybe the, I mean, that is the, it's not, I don't, yeah, it's, it's more, yeah, it's a question whether there is something different connected with Kittler's, Kittler's bones, exactly this stubbornness, uh, this um, anti, um, this resistance against uh, sublation and recursion and, and so on. Um, thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, when I was preparing this, and this is also, I know this is a standard um, caveat taken from a larger work or whatever. The, what I was going to prepare for today, originally I was going, I was thinking about the bones were often precisely the place that, precisely the material that disrupted these recursions. Um, and, and so I think that this, that actually fits in quite well. This, this, this moment where the spirit is bone in Hegel, which just stops the next turn from happening. Um, is very significant to me. When I came to the, the musician essay, though, I, I, I did think that the bones here functioned a little differently. And because I was thinking in terms of this sort of recursion changes over the course of his career, and I think I thought that the bones here maybe were altered a little bit than those early bones, and that they were more of a figure for what was happening later on with the books on Greece. I mean, this is written around the same time as the book on Greece. Um, and that here, the cycle coming through uh, the bones, it, it's, it, in grounding this, the, the cycle of film, it, you know, the idea is that there are bones that are no longer anything but their materiality. That enables the production of the visualization of movement which enables the virtual space of film, which is what produces the subject where the, which, which is then grounded in the bones that are just themselves. Um, but, sorry, I sort of lost my own track here. It's, it's actually very intimidating to be up on a stage instead of down on the floor like I'm, like I'm used to. Um, but those bones that only speak for themselves no longer memento mori and what are in a sense already a project of product of filmic visualization. And so they are part of the loop, I think, here, in terms of his history of film. And, but they function, they ground the possibility of this visualization by being literal. But, it, they, but they're not precisely literal. I, I do think um, they are, that's why I, I do think they're a metaphor of their own non-metaphoricity. And it, to, so the long way to answer your question, I think they're, they're slightly different here than the early, earlier pieces of the material. I don't actually know how to bring them together. Your talk reminded me of, of a different tackling of the question of cursivity and recursivity made by Barbara Johnson when she, when she, when she begins with rhetorics and, and prolepsis and then she asks about whether a woman is cursive or recursive. And since Friedrich's uh, Kittler early and later work was, was all about women, as we've learned from yesterday, and the question of the Rausch and the Geräusch and the Geschrei. So I was wondering whether there is also, in this figure of putting some flesh on the bones and the real and the metaphoricity and non-metaphoricity uh, gendered um, a gendered question that I feel that you have addressed, but maybe you you can elaborate a little more. Well, as we learned in the first paper today, of course, um, the if if drunkenness is somehow related to the the sort of 
Rausch of the early Greek being unification of math and language and meaning and love. Um, it, it is about Eros. And for him, it, it, you know, I, I don't know why I left it out, but we can talk about so, it. Uh, so can, can this be part of the foreclosed mechanism? No, I don't, I don't think he's foreclosing. I think I did. <laughs> um, you know, for, for this, if we're going to continue to talk about the sirens, which is, of course, the, one of the largest figures for recursivity, as we know, um, he, he goes to, he, Hitler returns to this beach saying Odysseus actually landed and goes and uh, has intercourse with the sirens because for various reasons you couldn't see certain parts of the island that he describes from the water, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so when we, if we're returning to this sort of joyous uh, situation, it's, it's always and already imbricated with uh, women. I mean, this is, he's always bringing it back to love, as we heard in the first paper. And so I, I, that's a failure. I think mean, that's something I foreclosed. I don't think he did. Um, it's, it's also an interesting way which supports the idea that Hitler still sees, reads uh, Homer, Homeric verse and stuff as being able something with which one can actually reconstruct historical events. And the other maybe foreclosure, if there is this sort of fiction of nonfiction, is that his technique is in that way not that different than some of the things he critiques in the humanities. But um, that had nothing to do with love, I'm sorry. Could we begin thinking about, based on your topic, uh, a Kitlerian historiography of, of war crimes and human rights, this is mm -hmm. your other aspect of mm -hmm. research. One of the other things that emerges in, in the last 15, 20 years is the increasing centrality of forensic anthropology and the use of the archaeology and excavation of bones of victims of human rights crimes as, a, as, as testimony in of itself, almost as a post-anthropological testimony that displaces and dislocates the spoken uh, witness and survivor. So that to me suggests uh, uh, maybe a, a split historiography, but one in which certainly a Kitlerian perspective is emerging and permeating, uh, or could possibly permeate a uh, history of human rights, uh, forensic uh, investigation, um, post-war reconciliation, transitional justice, war crime, mm -hmm. tribunals, and the rest. Um, thank you for bringing up the bones and mass graves and things I hadn't, I hadn't yet gotten to that point. Um, the relationship between testimony and evidence then is, is sort of at stake. And it's, it's, it's one of the interesting things here too because then bones, rather than being speared as bone, or actually the production of these dead things being the product of life, um, the bones can be, when bones become evidence, they foreclose testimony in a way. And so this is where I believe it's in, in the incident of my death where Derrida talks about testimony. You know, it, it's value lies precisely in the fact that it's not, it, it, it might not be evidence, it might be lie, it might be fiction. Because if it, if it were, abs if you could trust it absolutely, it would just be evidence, and this is the opposition that's set up. Um, and I think that if we were, I don't know exactly what we mean by re, re Hitlerian historiography. The, the dug up bones are narratives in themselves, and they're read as narratives. Yeah. That they, as mm -hmm. as exactly. As yes. I mean, this becomes, this becomes a, a network. Of, of in which the bones then then presu presume to speak for themselves without any voice. I mean, again, stripping stripping out the geist from the geist is Wissenschaft. There is no interpretation. There's no hermeneutics when bones are evidence of what happened. I mean, that you've, that's a that's a, you've already provided the reading of it. I think now that's for someone who's also from doing my history of then rights and the political side of things. That's a little problematic. You know, it's, that's been written. Uh, Hitler Hitler's hit war has no Hitler. Well, in this in this historiography. Uh, there, there is no perpetrator. There is no victim. There's just the bones that attest to a process that has occurred. That was would be my problem with pursuing that track as a. But I mean, it's possible to do that. Yeah. If we take a particular strain of what I would call unsettle me about a Kitlerian analysis, history or historiography of this is 
just taking my little the film as an example, film happens, produces a space for visualization in which we can then see the bones as nothing but their own materiality. And it's just, as these loops close, you know, the, the, um, I'm trying to remember exactly which essay was it, I think it was Silent Recursions. There, this, this, this process can take the term where our writing tools are writing on us, our writing tools are writing on writing tools, um, our writing about our writing about our, our writing on our writing about writing tools, and then finally our writing tools are writing writing tools, and no one did anything. Film happened, and the war came. That's what I mean by no perpetrator. Um, this evidence then read in a sort of loop, um, whatever whatever material history that the bones of these crimes are then placed within. I would see the danger of it following a similar trajectory where something happened and then there were dead bones without there actually being someone did something. Um, that to me is a danger of these recursions. When I said I was trying to work with what it meant that I'm always sort of doing Hitler in a sense, I, this comes from a failed paper I gave last year at a different conference about, um, about constructing um, digital subjects, but this actually started with film, which actually started with my science of motion. I realize it's, as I'm reading it, I'm just doing one big recursive loop again. So I've been trying to deal with what recursions mean to me, and to me they're a little dangerous for this reason. And so that's what I meant by I think there'd be no perpetrator. I think what you're outlining is, is exactly the case for me, and I see them potentially inco be incompatible. Yeah, just a brief comment. Uh, <clears throat> Cautionary note, certainly unnecessary in this group regarding Goethe uh, and taking him at his word. Yeah. Taking him at his word about mathematics or bones or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would like to think that there is an alternative mathematics that is drunken in Goethe. One non only needs to think of the most seminal scene in Faust I, Hexenküche, and the Hexen einmal eins. And there's uh, a, a whole book yet to be written on Goethe and mathematics that pursues that idea of a, a drunken, a dancing, a bacchanal mathematics, uh, it seems to me. And then I'll make a loop a little bit back to Goethe and science. Uh, and in this case, not the anatomical works, but, uh, or the works on osteology, I should say, uh, but on... Uh, uh, plant metamorphosis and just point out the peculiar idea about this leaf, Alice is no blot, that goes through a series of recursions and that Goethe does his uh, proof as it were or his description of the recursive process in a, with a mathematical gesture. Mm -hmm. That is imitating Spinoza's geometric method and so on and so forth. There's a big discourse here, and again, just begging not to take Goethe at his word. Oh, no, I, thank you very much. I love the idea of a sort of Goethe and drunken mathematics. Like I said, I was only half joking when I made Goethe Kittler of Entre like, I think there is something to be said there, um, and perhaps with the morphologies and whatnot. Also, in some ways, in the way that he talks about method itself is. Yes, Chadwick, thanks a lot. Just two comments. The first, a very minor one. Um, there are two instances in Musik and Mathematik where bones appear or significantly do not appear. At the end of the second volume, in the long chronology, the 30,000-year history, which Kittler supplies with all kinds of dates, the very first date is a flute made of a vulture bone. Music starts with bones. The other bone, of course, are bones that do not appear, namely the bones which are said to be on the Siren Islands, but which are not because the sirens do not kill people. That is PR done by the sexual competitors of the sirens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the main point is the following. I think it is not coincidental that so many talks now are centering around this recursion concept. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I think that is the key term to unlock actually the main project. In defense of what Larson said, one of the problems that we were interested in when we were doing that special was, what is the term recursion trying to do instrumentally in a theory? And two, I think that what you're doing is a very, very splendid example of how you can get out of the quandaries. The problem is we should also remain aware of what is he trying to hide, which is one of the big questions in Kittler always. Um, thank you very much. Um,
I mean, the unenviable position of not knowing what to say other than I agree with you completely. Um, <laughs> I mean, recursions, I, obviously there's been a lot of work on this and it's, it, it's been my personal bug be, uh, bugabear in, in dealing with them at all and partially because they're, they're so useful for me as well when I'm doing these histories. Um, I just, the more I read them now, I think, and this is not to uh, contradict any of the suggestions you just made, I, I am starting to see them as a, as a, as a, as a functional, as a functional fiction, you know, and that's why I called it a realism of sorts, um, and why I was invested in its uh, metaphorology of it all. So, um, and that's not to say they're not useful. I mean, this is the idea. Once you start getting into not only Kittler but some of other theorists, and you have the difference between virtual and real that then collapses. So the, the fictionality of it is, is what makes it real. Um, and I guess that's where I was going to. They're, they're real when they're not, or they're not when they are. Thank you so much for your presentation, Chadwick. Um, I just um, had, it's been buried, a little bone to pick with you, but um, Clark actually um, articulated or disarticulated, and I was then going to do simply um, the recursive loop with you and wonder, if you wish to wonder at this point um, of your exertion and performance, um, <clears throat> let's say in a Nietzschean, Kitlerian way, why you needed to set Goethe's subject on the side of sobriety. You know, because clearly something in your talk required that. I don't think it was a stray shot or an aleatory, um, let's say, off-ramp that you took, but something required that. But you're, you're so right that you suddenly sobered up our <laughs> drunken Goethe and his um, bateau ivre. And so one of my um, instincts was, and then we can, you don't even have to respond for the first time in your life since we've met. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Is, I was responding before we met. Uh, very nice. Um, is, is to ask you if you want to, but this sounds so suddenly professorial, I, I apologize in advance and forever. If you wanted to rhetorically take on um, the utterance, man is a drunken town musician, you know, as, as what kind of a... An intervention is that, what does it want or not want to say? How does it refuse itself? Or Not that you have to um, move into the new anthropology, but you were pushing for alternative anthropologies and post-anthropologies, and then um, you suggested that you could jam on Rausch, and this kind of um, drunkenness and inebriation that also came up briefly um, as a sneak preview in, in Rüdiger Kampus' talk as in the form of hallucination. So there's, or in Elisabeth Weber's talk as, as a kind of delirium that shows up, but you needed to keep it sober and clean, and so I was wondering about that rehab of I mean, Goethe. Rehabbing Goethe. Exactly, that Hitler needed to set up Goethe as the hero of a discourse network that is going to be superseded. And on the way toward complete binary digitization, in fiber optic cables where there are no differences anymore. And so we're back in Greece where math and language and alphabet and everything is united. And somehow that he, he needs to show this history. Um, it's, it's, this is when it starts sounding exactly like Heideggerian Seinsgeschichte, when these are stages of relations to a type of being um, and we've, fallen off true revelation, and we're getting back to it with digitization. And that Goethe is part of the sort of, not, I won't call it a false history, but, not, not, but it's, it's part of the split between uh, when, when math and, and language get split from one another, and it's that this is a bad thing. You know, this is, happens with the Platonics, basically. It's this desire to go back to the, the pre-Socratics. Pre um, so I, th I think that and Kittler wants him to be sober, but I am guilty sometimes of thinking of Goethe that way myself. Um, Goethe, the figure who could handle anything, who no matter what came his way was able to just deal with it and move on. There is, there is that sense of mastery about the figure. Um, 
Well, so. Um, okay, if there I, are no more. You, thank you for ending that. <laughs> 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 well. <laughs>